Welcome back from fall break. Some of you guys are actually here at school with us today, so we are super excited about that. Some of you guys are coming tomorrow to school, and we are super, super excited about that and getting to meet all you guys. Some of you guys are still virtual, so you are still talking to your virtual teachers, um, but math will look a little bit different now that we're back in-person school. Um, so you will still see a video every day of a lesson, um, but if you're at school, your teacher will teach that to you in person, but we still want to give you access to the video so that if you have any questions or um, if you didn't complete your work in class and need to rewatch the video, or if it was just a confusing day um, and the following day you didn't really understand that work, you could rewatch that. It also gives parents an idea of how we teach things in class. So if you are trying to figure out, um, say some homework or an exit slip or something like that, they have access to watching those videos too. So you will still have the videos and you will have an exit slip every day, whether you do the exit slip on, um, on your virtual day or in class, you will still go into Schoology um, and enter in that exit slip. Um, we are on lesson uh, 2.10. We are still multiplying, okay? So just kind of want to refresh you on multiplying after fall break. Um, we will be doing lesson 2.10 on Monday and Tuesday. It's not going to be the same video. There will be a separate video tomorrow with different problems on there. But I want you to know that you're going to be using this lesson for both days. We'll still be doing Run the Race making sure we're reading the question, underlining the keywords, um, figuring out what we're doing with the numbers, rereading it, make sure we're answering all of the parts, okay? We are gonna stick to the partial product method. Um, you are welcome to work it out. This way, it's probably all to sleep. <laughs> Announcement. Um, you are welcome to work it out standard. If your parents have shown you how to do that and you know how to do it, I'm fine with that. Um, so you can, check your answer with me. So we are going to not do unlock the problem or the example. We're gonna go straight to the share and show on page 121. Okay, and we're just gonna start with number two, just kinda as a refresher. So it likes us to give an estimate. We do that so that we know whether our answer is close or not, whether we know our, whether our answer or not makes sense. Um, so it would be reasonable if the estimate is really close to the actual answer. So you can do it a couple of different ways. Um, I would estimate this as close to the real answer as I possibly can um, in my head. So I could do 40 times four because I know four times four is 16 and then you throw that zero for the 40 on the end. So if my answer is close to 160, then I should be correct or I could do 40 and I could even round that up to five, okay? But we don't really wanna use the rounding um, to the nearest 10, because if you round that to the nearest 10, it's zero, and your answer is zero, and that doesn't help you uh, with knowing. So um, you know that four times four is 16, so four times 40 is 160. So that just makes, um, you know, when you're estimating, it doesn't matter, um, which place you go to, but you wanna go to the closest one that you can do in your head, if that makes sense, hopefully. So, if you put this in expanded form, that would be 40 plus two, all times four. We all go ahead and throw that zero on the end because it's times 40, four times four is 16 eight times, I mean, sorry, four times two is eight. I'm getting ahead of myself. And that's something that we can do in our head is 168. Okay, let's move all the way over to number five. Notice there's a dollar sign in front of it. So the answer will have to have a dollar sign in front of it. So if you wanna go ahead and put that, that would be great. So to put 63 in expanded form, that is 60 plus three all times seven, and we know that that'll end in a zero. Seven times six is 42, and seven times three is 21. 
I can add that in my head, but if you can't, that's okay. I usually just put this number under and add it. And that's $441. What do we need to look at to see if we're close? Okay, so I would do 60 times three because I know six times seven is 42. And if it's 60, you throw a zero on the end. So is 441 close to 420? Yeah, so it's probably correct. That's one um, easy way to kind of check your work. Now, if you're unsure about the steps of multiplication, you can always, you know, add that seven times if you have time to double check your work or just don't look at your box method. Try to solve it standard algorithm, or if you don't know how to do that, you can just not look at your box and resolve it again, count up again. Okay, I want you to pause the video and do the even numbers. I want you to do number six and number eight on, the, on, on your own, just this part right here, the even number. So pause your video, do those, and then come back and check your answer. Hopefully for number six, you got something close to 30 times two, which is 60. So if you didn't get something close to 60, go ahead and pause the video again and rework that. But the actual answer is 66. And then same with number eight. I'll, I'm gonna go ahead and round that up to 40 in my head. So 40 times eight, I know that four times eight is 32 and with it being a 30 would have that zero on the end so the correct answer here is 288 now you should have it worked out right here alrighty switching gears just a little bit on number 15 and 16 it's um, identifying relationships. It's writing a rule, okay? So you're finding the unknown numbers. Something that we haven't talked a whole lot about is if we have an unknown number in an equation, we call that a variable. Above the unknown numbers, write variable. And that's the unknown. That's the thing that we don't know. So a variable is a letter that represents the unknown number. So in parentheses or next to it, put letter. So when you see these big kids, high school kids doing algebra and it says, you know, X times three equals Y plus C, all that craziness, you're starting to learn that now. You're starting to use a variable. It just means when we say blank, it means the same thing. So if I say two plus blank equals four, we know that that blank is two. But if I put a variable in there, if I said two plus S equals four, then you would just have to say S equals two. It's not as hard as, it, as they make it seem. So down here, it's saying in every carton of eggs, there are 12 eggs. In every two carton of eggs, there are 24 eggs. Every three carton of eggs, we don't know. And four, 48, and five, we don't know. So it's asking for a variable here for carton and for eggs. One of the best rules to use is whatever it begins with, whatever letter the unknown thing begins with. So here we're gonna use a C, and here we're gonna use an E. And when, when it comes up, your teacher will tell you that we, a lot of time math uses an X, as a math teacher, I don't love to use an X because it looks like the multiplication symbol and sometimes it can get confusing. 
what other letter looks like a symbol. Hopefully you said a T because a T and a plus sign look a lot alike. So if I have to use a T, I put a little tail on it. But anyway, so what is the relationship here? What's the relationship between one and 12 and two and 24? What's the rule? What are you doing to see? What are you doing to the one each time? So you are multiplying whatever that number is on top by 12. So the rule is multiply C by 12. Okay, same thing for number 16. We've got rows and seats. So in two rows, there's 32 seats. In three rows, there's 48 seats. In four rows, there's 64 seats. So our variable for row is going to be R, and our variable for seats is gonna be S. Be really careful and make it look like an S and not a five. My lovely friends with their crazy handwriting, you better fix that. So, hmm, that's a big number, right? Because I know my, you know, two facts, threes, fours, fives, six, seven, eights, nines, tens, elevens, twelves, that's more than that, right? But what is half of 32? That's what you're figuring out. Because it's two times something equals 32. So the rule is multiply R by how much? So if you take 32 and cut it in half, how could you do that? One way you could do it is you could draw circles. Okay, you're dividing it by two and just go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, until you get all the way up to 32. Now I know that half of 30 is 15 and then there's two left over. So we would split that and they would each get one. Oh, plus. So that'd be 16 and 16 plus 16. Six plus six is 12. One, two, three would be 32. So you're multiplying by 16. That stretched your brain a little bit, huh? Stretched it a little bit. Okay, I want to skip number 17 and move to the multi-step problem on the back. We're gonna do number 18 and 19 today. So number 18 says, at the speeds shown, how much further, farther could a black-tailed jackrabbit run than a desert cottontail in seven seconds? So you have to take a look at this chart. Black-tailed jackrabbit um, can run 51 feet per second. And then the desert cottontail can run 22 feet per second. So you just gotta think through this. It's a multi-step, there's different things to do. So we've read it, right? We gotta underline those key words. What are we doing here? At the speed shown, how much further? Okay, so we know we're gonna find a difference there. How much further? So we know we're gonna be subtracting. I put a little subtraction symbol. Could a black-tailed jackrabbit run than a desert cotton jackrabbit, or? desert cottontail in seven seconds. So you're doing something with that number seven. So I need to know how much a jackrabbit runs in seven seconds and how much a cottontail runs in seven seconds and then subtract those. So my equation is gonna, I'm gonna work down here. And if you need a plain sheet of paper, then use a plain sheet of paper. So I need to know the jackrabbit, which is 51, I need to know how much, um, how far it runs in seven seconds. So that would be 
51 times 7. And then whatever that is, I'm going to put a J above it because that's a jackrabbit. And then the cottontail, I need to know how um, it runs, how far it runs in 7 seconds. So I'm taking its speed, which is 22 times 7 it's seven seconds. That's the cottontail. And then when I get both of those, I'm figuring out how much further this is. So I'm subtracting those two. So if you get used to writing out an equation, you're not going to skip all the steps. You're not going to do one math problem and then be like, okay, I'm done. So 51 times seven, 50 plus one, all times seven, and yes, I'm doing this pretty quick, guys. We've been doing this for over a week now. We did it before fall break. Now we're back to it again. So I'm rolling through this pretty quick. Don't Announcement again. This Miss Pace's lovely voice. <laughs> and then seven times one is seven. And I can do that in my head as 357. Okay, again, I like to label it. That's the jackrabbit. Okay, that's how fast he goes in seven seconds. Then I'm taking away from whatever the cottontail is, which is 22. So 20 plus two, all times seven. So seven times 20 is 140. And seven times two is 14. I can add those together in my head as well because I can do 140 plus 10, which is 150, plus four more is 154. And that's the cottontail. Subtract those two. So seven minus four is three. Five minus five is zero. And three minus one is two. So your answer is 203 feet. Lastly, the black-tailed jackrabbit hops about seven feet in a single hop. How far can it hop in five seconds? How far can it hop in five seconds? So you're looking for the jackrabbit, which is here. How far can it hop in five seconds? Now, do we need to know how far it can hop in a single hop? No, that's unneeded information. So we don't have to know that in order to solve this. We simply need to know how far it, how far it jumps per or how, what the speed is, sorry, how many feet per second, which is 51. Times five seconds. So 50 plus one, all times five. So 50 times five, Throw your zero down there, 250. Five times one is five. You can add that in your head to get 255. And make sure you label it. What's it asking? How far can it hop in five seconds? So that's 255 feet. Remember, you will come back to this page tomorrow. Do a few on this page and a few on the next. I will see you guys tomorrow.